The Tolkien Road, Episode 162, The Hobbit, Chapter 14, Fire and Water. Welcome in to The Tolkien Road, Episode 162, Chapter 14 of The Hobbit, Fire and Water. Greta, how you doing? Hey, I'm fantastic. Right on. How are you? I could not be better. Awesome. I'm recording the Tolkien Road. I know, and it's a beautiful day I feel outside. Like, I feel like I kind of sounded sarcastic. I'm being, you know, I'm being serious. Well, I, I mean, knew you were being I serious. I could probably be better, um, but I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. You know, honest assessment. Good. Feeling pretty good about things. Awesome. Yeah, you know, a uh, little, little nervous, kind of bracing myself that maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna get sick. Uh, one, <laughs> one of our kids. Uh, it's got some kind of nasty stomach bug, so um, I'm, a little, yeah. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared that it's going to hit me. You know, worrying about it does absolutely no good. I know. I took action. You did take action. I took some supplements, some vitamin C, uh, some other supplements that probably didn't do anything for me, but I took them <laughs> anyway. And um, and then I put some of that plague rescue on my uh, um, on my hobbit feet. On your hobbit feet. Yeah. Well, you know, just trying to think about it. Yeah. Because worrying, it automatically, it uh, it compromises your immune response. Yeah. So I say just chill, you know, mm, just roll with it. Compromises your immune response. That yep. sounds fascinating, but I don't want to get down that rabbit trail because uh, <laughs> that could be a long rabbit trail. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I said, grand scheme of things, feeling pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, what's also really cool is that World Cup's going on, so that's awesome. Okay. And College World Series starts today, so... And it's a beautiful day outside. You know what? It, the thought just, occurred, to talk, talk the thought just occurred to me, right, about the Women's World Cup. Yeah. Um, that, um, you know, the U.S., there, you know, it's kind of controversial because the U.S. women's team beat uh the Thai the Thai team uh thirteen to nothing in the first mm-hmm. in their first match. Mm-hmm. And you know, there was a little bit of like, oh, they ran up the score on them or something. There's you know it's controversy for different stuff. Uh I am not, you know, I, I'm like if you're gonna play, you're gonna play. Right? You know, go out right. there and play. If it's a you know, if it's if it's legitimate, you know, competition, then it that it is what it is, right? And um but I kinda wonder because they scored thirteen goals. Mm-hmm that's bad luck for them right Ooh. we're in, we're, I mean, we're reading a book right now where the that hobbit the title character thought. is he's the 14th character because mm-hmm. they the 14th they didn't person want 13 they, they didn't want just 13 wow right? i had not even thought of that so wouldn't that be something if they like if they just crashed and burned on, right because they scored 13 goals yeah wow that's Yikes. something something to, interesting to think about seriously you know what else is interesting to think about is patreon Oh yeah, it's really interesting. I love thinking about Patreon. It's really interesting to think about uh, giving money to your favorite podcast, which is the Tolkien Road. Obviously, right? Because um, we're the coolest. I want to say a special thanks to our newest patron, uh, Teresa Col- Colangelo. I think that's how you say it, Teresa. So forgive me if I mispronounced it, and you know, feel free to correct my pronunciation. Um, but uh, yeah, Teresa. Yeah. Um, Teresa, Thanks, thank Teresa. you so much. Thanks for uh, she sent us an awesome note, which we'll read, yeah. you know, towards uh, with the correspondence at the end of this episode, and um, you know, just be like Teresa. Yeah, mm-hmm. be like Teresa. We, you know, we we need to like make T-shirts that say "Be like Teresa." <laughs> be like Teresa, <laughs> and just wear wear them around. Um, uh, yeah, um, you can go over to Patreon.com and be like Teresa and uh, give a pledge of one dollar or more per episode. And like we said, you can set any limits you want to on this. You can be it unlimited. You can decide to give. You can. De- you could decide to give a hundred bucks per episode, mm-hmm. and just be like, keep making episodes, and we do it, right? Totally. And not put any limits on it. If you're uh, if you're Bill Gates, and uh, and then if if you're not, or if you fall somewhere in between, you can just say, hey, I can only give one dollar per month. I understand. You know, we hey, we get it, right? You can say one dollar, one episode is my max, and you only get one dollar a month, and yeah, that's cool. every little bit helps. And you're still like you're still a patron, totally, right? You get all the cool patron on page page page. What's the word? Patreon. 
I know. I was going to try to make it a, an adjective, but Patri- I think I failed. Patronizations? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even all know. All the it, patriotic stuff. All the, oh, nice. Patriotic. Patriotic. Yeah. There it like, is. Yeah. It's like patriotic, but, but patriotic. But it sounds like it involves the future. It, patriotic. Oh, it does, kind of. Yeah. Huh. Don't you all want to be patriotic? Mm-hmm. I want to be patriotic. Yeah. Sounds so. like it sounds like a robot's your dad. <laughs> <laughs> patriotic. Patriotic. Uh, so, yeah, um and hey, right now what what you get is you get the episodes um on early access, right? So early release. as soon as we're done recording this episode, I'm going to go and I'm going to post it to Patreon um so that you guys whoever is a patron can go ahead and listen in. And um and then Everybody else has to wait until I get around to uploading it to our normal feed. And who knows how long that's going to take. Uh, I mean, it could, you know, I get I la- mean, I, I'm kind of lazy. Yeah. So. I mean, I asked you to, you know, do something months ago and it's still not done. So I don't remember what it was. I, <laughs> that's not very helpful. <laughs> I know. Yes, she forgot. All right. Um, it worked well, out perfectly. Yeah. All right. Um. And then, hey, you know, if you're not in a place where you can where you can support us financially, uh, head on over to iTunes and or whatever app you you use to listen and give us a five star rating over there. Right, easiest way to help get the word out about the Tolkien Road, and you can leave us an awesome comment over there just to let the world know that the Tolkien Road is the greatest podcast of all time. All time. That's right. That was nice. Thank you. All right, so can we move on? <sighs> yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just doing my due diligence I know, here. I know. Nothing right. wrong with it. I'm just you know trying to. Keep things moving along. That's all. I was going to move them along. You didn't have to uh, tell me to. Well, you know what? Sometimes I feel like maybe I just should. Okay. That would just help. Well, you heard all it the there. Things. All right. <laughs> yes, you did. Latron Prime. Latron What's Prime. Going on? What's going uh, on? What's going on? It's crickets from Latron Prime. Oh man! You it clearly is crickets. didn't hear our plea from the last episode. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's it's starting to. I think I said last time, and you know, every every week. You know, every episode that goes by and we don't hear something, you know, it makes us feel a little concerned for old Latron. Or maybe hopeful that they're just in, you know, they're just working so hard right. to get things moving that they don't have time they to got, tweet. They ain't got time to be one of them twits. Mm-mm. 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 Twi- one of them yeah. Twitter tweeter twits. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe, maybe it's hopeful. Well. So maybe we just shouldn't worry. You know, that's the theme of this episode. Just don't worry. Our our thoughts and prayers are with you, Latron Prime. Latron. Yeah. Thoughts and prayers for Latron Prime. All right. Um, let's talk about Hobbit chapter 14. Yeah, let's do it. Another pretty short chapter. Mm-hmm. In fact, most of the chapters from here on out are shorter chapters. Um, it really, you know, and, and this one, after we said like chapter 13 was, was kind of slow, right? Chapter 14, you know, kind of exciting. It's short. Yeah. To the point, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, some act, some good action going on there. So, last chapter, of course, um, we were with Bilbo and the dwarves as they entered the Lonely Mountain, and they found that Smog wasn't at home. Mm-hmm. Right, Smog's gone, mm-hmm. and you know they're they're just like, where is he? And then they kind of start to realize that, well, maybe I don't know, maybe he's not coming back, or maybe we can go ahead and try to fortify and and that kind of thing. And we didn't know in that chapter, right, where Smog was. Well. So here's my question. Yeah. Last chapter and this chapter, are the events happening simultaneously? More or less. More yeah. or less. Okay. Yeah. So we're not going backwards or forwards. It's kind of Yeah. While Bilbo and the dwarves are in the mountain, it's kind of chapter like, fourteen is happening. It's kind of like meanwhile in Lake Town. Gotcha. Right? Okay. Yeah. That answers my question. Cool. Yeah. Uh good question. Thanks. So um all right. So meanwhile, back in Lake Town. Right. Meanwhile, back in Lake Town, um, they are, you know, it's been a while now since the dwarves left to go to the Lonely Mountain. So they're all kind of like, hmm, you know, I wonder what's uh, wonder what's going on out there. Uh, it's, it begins now. If you wish, like the dwarves, to hear news of Smaug, you must go back again to the evening when he smashed the door and flew off in a rage two days before. The men of the Lake Town Esgaroth were mostly indoors, for the breeze was from the black east and chill. But a few were walking on the quays and watching as they were fond of doing. The stars shine out from the smooth patches of the lake as they opened in the sky. I'm pretty sure that's keys. Keys? Is it supposed to be? It's keys. I was wondering that as I said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you sure about that? I am. I would risk, uh, if it were a Final Jeopardy question, I would risk all of my all of my earnings. That's how confident I am. Survey says... Key. Woo! 
Oh, man. Final Jeopardy winner! I was going to say it that way, too. Wait, no, there's an alternate pronunciation. Key, no, it's supposed to hey, be Look, key. it says Quay right there. No, it, that's not how you read that. Besides, they're going to, they're not, they clearly, that's not the one they put in the vocal pronunciation, so it's clearly just there to help you feel I'm better I'm just about never going to pronounce anything again. Okay, I'll take over. It's fine. I I just feel like You're I just throwing I the towel like on I'm all a, pronunciations. I feel like I'm unworthy. <laughs> we just need to make sure and get it right. That's all. Key. I think. See, I think. Key. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Three for three. All right. So Ooh, anyway, wait. no, just stop it. You're fine. Hey, you're the one that brought this up. Well, well, I'm clearly right. You're okay. like digging in like all kinds of random places to try and find hey, support for your Google, incorrect pronunciation. Google, Google Q U A Y, mm-hmm. and it'll come up with the dictionary on Google first thing, and you'll see the first one is key, but then the second one is K W long A, quay. So well, but all the it's an alternate pronunciation. Okay, but it's not the main one, so I still win. Uh, we all just yeah. agree to disagree. If on only this. we had Tolkien here to settle this for he us. He would totally go with key. Totally. Yeah, he probably would. He all would. Right. It's such an odd way to spell it. All right. Um, okay. So yeah, there. Uh, you know, things are kind of quiet in Lake Town, and um, but all of a sudden, they start. They see a light from the north, light. from the direction of the Lonely Mountain. Um, look, the lights again. Last night, the watchmen saw them start and fade from midnight until dawn. Something is happening up there. And right. So what they would have seen the night before was, uh, the dragon coming out and, and smashing the door and, and att- well, and attacking, attacking the mountain the first time. Right. Right. So when he right. was flying around, like, mm-hmm. you know, trying to get um, the doors. Yeah. And, uh, and then one of them says, of course, because we were familiar with the the old legend, right? Perhaps the king under the mountain is forging gold. It is a long since he went north. It is time the songs began to prove themselves again. And then another with a grim voice says, Which king? As like as not, it is the marauding fire of the dragon, the only king under the mountain we have ever known. Uh, and the rest of them are like, Oh, you're such a, you know, you're such a Debbie Downer. Right? Yeah, exactly. Stop being a buzzkill. Right. Loser. Uh, but turns out that the grim voiced one is correct. Yep. He has cause for concern. He has good cause no for concern. No wonder he's so grim voiced and faced. He he knew there was bad stuff going on. Yeah. Yep. You could feel it in his bones. And this is Bard. He's finally named. It is. We finally find yeah. out that this is Bard. Uh Bard the Bowman. So um so yeah, they they eventually they do realize, right? Um they and, and some people still think it's oh it's it's fulfilling the prophecies and and then and then the grim voiced one again He's like, the dragon is coming or I am a fool. Cut the bridges to arms, to arms, right? So he is convinced he's the only one that thinks it's the dragon, but it turns out he's right. He's right. So. Well, you know. So things start getting crazy when, when they when everybody else starts, you know, starts realizing that, yeah, he's right. This is the dragon coming. Um, well, at least he, you know, at least he didn't, at least he had the, the guts to say it. Give them at least a little bit of warning. Right, yeah. You know? Instead of backing down and telling them what they wanted to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. There's something, there's, th- this chapter has some interesting, you know, dynamics, I think, from a, um, I, w- I kept thinking, like, kind of a political perspective. And I don't mean to get, like, political, like, contemporary politics, but, like, just in terms of, like, politics and human mm-hmm. nature. Because the master right? figures have what happens. Even, what happens yeah. to the master a little later mm-hmm. in the chapter, but just also, like, Bard being, you know, kind of, the guy who's like, who, who, who's probably, a, you know, a little bit smarter than most people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's, he's kind of a realist, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and because of that, he's not super popular. Right. Probably. Yeah. That's why he hasn't been elected master. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. I mean, he's I not telling people what they want to hear. I don't know that he has, he's run for master. Right. That's something you can do in, in Lake Town. But, uh, but yeah, that's why, you know, maybe that's part of the reason he's not. But, uh, but, when push comes to shove, you want somebody like Bard on your side. Totally. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you want you want to be a little bit more of a, uh, you don't want somebody blowing sunshine up your, you know, where, right? True. Um, you want somebody True. who's going to tell it to you straight. So exactly. Bard is apparently that guy here for Lake Town. Yep. 
Uh, and just in time, too, right? Because um, things might have been even worse if Bard hadn't sounded the alarm when he did. And uh, because Smaug it is only, you know, is quick to come upon the town and just start wreaking havoc. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. He is. He's causes, ready to go. Causes a lot of damage. And what's really... I, I feel like... I, I don't remember this from the first time I read it, but the uh, the master is very, like, poorly portrayed here. Especially. Yeah. And they do it in the movie, too. I just didn't remember him being quite that bad. But he was like, you know... It says the master himself was turning to his great gilded boat, hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself. Yeah. So he's n- not, you know, he's not a go down with the ship kind of captain. No, he's, he's a not. Save my, save my own skin kind of guy. He's um, he's he strikes me as very Machiavellian, right? He he knows he's good at, uh, he's good at getting power. What does and, Machiavellian mean? Well, you know, like Machiavelli, right? Like from oh, come on, you remember yeah. from from like high school, like history classes I've and that kind of thing. I've slept through most of my history classes. Like, Machiavelli was the guy that wrote the. <laughs> good. At least you're being honest. I am being honest. I think I think you'll remember this, but maybe not. Uh, Machiavelli was this like Italian guy who wrote the um, wrote the Prince. Like it, it was, his book was called The Prince, and um, it was in like it was t- sometime during the Renaissance, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Italian Renaissance. Okay. And he's like he's kind of like the icon of um, like shrewd politicians, right? Like mm. people who know how to kind of maneuver their way into positions of power. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's what we see from the master is he's good at like, you know, at dodging um, accusations mm-hmm. yeah. and um, and shifting the blame to other places. We'll talk. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we get when we get to him specifically. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, it it is interesting too. like to just to, before we do move on, like to think about um, how. Smaug's approach to the town does in a way fulfill the prophecy, right? Because it's like, um, it, it has a very strong appearance to what the prophecy said, like, you know, these rivers flow of gold flowing from the north. And his, his appearance is kind of like that, right? You can see how at first uh, the with, people of the yeah, town the would... Yeah, the fire and... Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't have it. I don't have the uh, original poem right in front of me, but... Um, but in a way, he's the he is the king under the mountain for that time being, right? And and I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just it's funny how that um, even though the prophecy isn't fulfilled in the way they expect it to be, um, it's it, it still has a strong resemblance. Yeah, to it's the reminiscent prophecy, of right. Of, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, Smaug is wreaking some serious havoc. Roaring, he swept back over the town. A hail of dark arrows leaped up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels, and their shafts fell back, kindled by his breath burning and hissing into the lake um no fireworks you ever imagined equaled the sights that night so smaug is like all they're shooting every arrow they have at him and nothing's doing it because of that armor right all that armor on him yeah under his belly and that's in addition to those that's not natural armor that's mm-hmm. on his scales is it or is has he added well, is it because he of the does jewels? have he does have the scales but he also has like all the jewels and the everything jewels. Crust, yeah. crusting okay. his so yeah. it's in addition to the scales i yeah. think so i think okay. that's how it works um and um and and really it says that bard is the only reason that anybody is trying to to defeat smog that they're all not just running right mm. and and even running in most cases is not going to do them any good because as it says um smog would basically just like consider that part of the fun right like he's he's just gonna he's gonna destroy lake town and then anybody who's left over he's just gonna He's just gonna kind of pick off one by one, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it says fire leaped from the dragon's jaws. He circled for a while, high in the air above them, lighting all the lake. The trees by the shores shone like copper and like blood, with leaping shadows of dense black at their feet. Then down he swooped straight to straight into uh, straight through the arrow storm, reckless in his rage, taking no heed to turn his scaling sides towards his foes, seeking only to set their town ablaze. So bad news, uh, bad news for Lake Town, and like you said. The master is uh, heading for the hills, right? Yeah. It says yeah. He, he gets into his great gilded boat, gilded boat, hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself. Um, so yeah, his his only thought really is to save himself, and that's yeah. that's how a Machiavellian person would be, right? Gotcha. They're not gonna okay. like a Machiavellian is going to say like, um, 
you know, uh, this place is done for. I may be, you know, I may be the leader of this town, but I'm smart enough to know that uh, it's every man for himself right now, right? And I plan to survive. Yeah. Right. That's how okay. Machiavellian is going to think. Uh, they're not going to think like, oh, I need to step up and and like be the leader and protect this town, right? Uh, and do what I can, even if that means going down, you know, going down with it, right? Right. Um, I'm going to do what I can um, as a as a father, right? Like is the father of this town in a way, right? Hmm. Um, to protect it, even if it means giving my own life. That's what he would not do. Right. That's what he would not do. Right. Right. Yeah. But that's what Bard. That's what Bard does. does. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's that whole like, you know, shep- or, you know, you could think of like shepherds, right? Like when, when Jesus in the gospels talks about, you know, a, a true shepherd versus a hireling, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, a shepherd, a, true, true a, a hireling care. runs off at the first sign of danger. A shepherd is the one who's going to stick around and fight, you know, to protect the sheep, right? right? Even if it means his own life. for them. Right? He has a relationship with them. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so Bard the ma- is the shepherd here. Bard is the shepherd. The master yeah. is the hireling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Master is the Good hireling. Analogy. Yeah. Uh, in more ways than one, um, because obviously he likes being master because he profits by it too. Exactly. But he's doing it for all the wrong reasons. Right. He's very selfish mm-hmm. motivations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, let's see. Um, so we find out, we find out, right, that Bard here is descendant from oh, yeah. the King of Dale, right? Uh, from the line of Geryon, Lord of Dale, whose wife and children had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. So in a way, it turns out Bard is this is is kind of a a king a king of sorts in his own right, right? He's he's descended. He's a descendant of the line. So does that mean he's been around for a while? I mean, if no, his uh, wife and child had escaped. No, the that means Geryon's Gir- wife and child. Oh, Geryon's wife. Right. And so so Bard is somehow. Okay. I don't know if there's a I don't know if there's a family tree for Bard anywhere in existence, but um, I mean, I think this was several generations ago, right? It's not like. It's not like I don't think Garyon was like his grandfather or something like that, um, and certainly not his father. Um, I think it's almost like kind of a forgotten line, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so could this be maybe like a um, like a precursor or a um, what's the right word? Uh, it could could this be kind of foreshadowing Ar- Aragorn in a way, or kind of be a type of? I, I, I'm sure there's a. Um, you know, I don't think, again, I don't think that, like, uh, Tolkien even, Tolkien didn't know who Aragorn was when, he was, writing, okay. when he was writing The Hobbit, right? Okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, so, because cause Strider doesn't come into this, uh, doesn't, like, Strider doesn't come into existence until Tolkien is writing Lord of the Rings um, in the 40s. Which is after this, or yeah. Late 30s, early 40s, which at least a couple of years after he wrote The Hobbit, right after The Hobbit was published. Um, and, uh, what we do, so, um, so I'm looking at the Tol- Tolkien gateway right now and, um, you've got Geryon who was in 2770 and then, and then the genealogy just goes straight to Bard. The first died 2977, but these are mere men, right? These are not Numenorians. So, right. um, right. their lifespan is like, you know, average lifespan, a, a good lifespan is probably like 70 or 80 years old. So, mm-hmm. um, Geryon died 2770 and, you know, you assume his son probably died. We'll, we'll just say a generation later, that would be 2810. So there's, there's several generations between, right. this is like, <laughs> between Geryon and you know, Bard. Yeah. I was born in 19, if I died, well, let's say if I died in 1979, 1977, right. And this, you know, Geryon was his ancestor who died in was my ancestor who died in 1770, right? So 200 years. So, 200, okay. uh, you know, I don't, it, whoever that was, like, is so yeah. far back that, you know, I, I could look it up maybe, but, you know, I wouldn't have any idea what they were like or Got who they it. were. Most people would not, re- like, yeah. remember that I'm the descendant of this person, right? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, this is, this is many generations removed, but we do find out through the third person omniscience of the narrator that Bard um, was indeed... Uh, descendant from this line from mm-hmm. the Lord of Dale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so he he has kingly blood in him. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he has this he has this great U bow, 
Um, and then, and he's still, he's, he's still trying to marshal any men who will stay and fight the dragon, mm-hmm. right? Even though they're, they're not having any luck against Smaug. Um, and all of a sudden, a little bird flutters up onto his shoulder, right? Yep. Uh, and who is that bird? The thrush. The thrush. The same thrush that helped Bilbo with the door. I would assume so. Yeah. Right? Um, unafraid, it perched by his ear and it bought, and it brought him news. Marveling, he found he could understand its tongue, for he was of the race of Dale. Remember, we we, le- we learned a little bit about this thrush several chapters ago. That there were special, uh, there's a special breed of thrush that uh, where the men of Dale could understand right. their language, yeah. and they were used as like messengers. Mm-hmm. So this thrush is apparently descended from that line of thrushes, right? And it finds Bard, and it gives him a little inside information. <laughs> Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, it tells him that, hey, the dragon has a weakness mm-hmm. under on its armor. You know, take a look. Yeah. Right. And the moon's about to rise. And so remember you'll be able how, to see it. how did the thrush learn that? The thrush learned that from Bilbo. Right. Thrush learned that from Bilbo because Bilbo brought the news back up after he went to visit Smile. Oh, that's right. right. And he'd seen it. Yep. He'd that's seen. Right. He had seen that little chink in the armor. Mm-hmm. Little chink in the armor. Oh. I like this little thrush. Yeah. Friendly yeah. little thrush. He is. Yeah. yeah. I kind of wish we had talking birds. <laughs> It'd be much more efficient than snail mail. This is true. But not as efficient as texting. True. So. But, but cuter. W- but cuter, definitely. Yeah, definitely cuter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of, maybe that's kind of the idea of the branding behind like Twitter, right? And there's a little Oh, little the bird. little bird? Yeah. I hadn't even thought of that. But, you know, this, this is... This is one of the first examples in Tolkien's published works of that motif of, um, you know, again, birds bringing some form of salvation, mm. right? You know, some, form of, some e- form of unexpected salvation. Yeah. Being like, um, being instigators of eucatastrophe, right? With the eagles being obviously another right, another way. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah, e- you know, eagles on several occasions, right? Right. Um, and... Uh, you know, and, and, and so this, you know, salvation often comes from the air, you know, kind of comes from above mm. for, uh, in Tolkien stories. Cool. Interesting little That's thing, very, right? very, very cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, in all, in the midst of all this, Bard remembers he has this black arrow, right? So how is this black arrow? Is it like larger than the others or is it like, cause we don't learn a whole lot about it, but apparently it's. It's special in some way Mm -hmm. because he says, I have saved you to the last. You have never failed me and always I have recovered you. Oh, here it is. I had you from my father and he from of old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. Right. So, yeah. So it's apparently it's been passed down Mm -hmm. and it could very well have been maybe forged by the dwarves. Yeah. Um. Yeah, totally. When I mean, they were living in the mountain. Um, we don't get a lot of, you know, a lot of story on the black arrow, but it's some kind of special arrow. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's better than just a regular arrow. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny in uh, in the original Legend of Zelda game, um, that came out in like, you know, nineteen eighty five or nineteen eighty six. Uh, great, great video game, but you know, very old school. Um. There was like you you know you early in the game you get like a bow and arrow and everything and you can use arrows a whole lot and um and they're just like normal arrows but then you get the silver arrow towards the end of the game right oh. the silver arrow and you have to have the silver arrow to win the game oh I see you have to have the silver arrow to silver win the game. arrow yeah hmm. so uh, maybe they took that as a little cue from oh maybe from, from the Hobbit spe- got to get the special arrow to kill to kill the uh, to ultimately beat the bad guy right yeah i could very well be it could very well be so bard shoots it and do you want to read that part do you... um so the dragon swooped right there uh yes the dragon swooped once more lower than ever and as he turned and dived down his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon but not in but not in one place the great bow twanged The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast, where the foreleg was flung wide. In it smote and vanished, barb, shaft, and feather, so fierce was its flight. 
With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, Smaug sh shot spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high in ruin. Yeah. Full on the town he fell. Yeah, so. So. Got, he got him. He got him. He got him right where he needed to. Yep. Um, so Smaug is no more. Smaug yep. is dead. All right. That was the end of Smaug and Esgaroth, but not of Bard. Not of Bard. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, it is really surprising given like you know, it, I've always just the more I've thought about it, the more like unusual I think um, the plot of the Hobbit gets in in this part of the book because you really do kind of expect that it's going to be like the dwarves and Bilbo that that kill. Smaug and that like killing yeah. Smaug is mm -hmm. the ultimate thing mm -hmm. but there's more there's still a lot more to go right right yeah and so it's like the death of Smaug is not the end of the story right um in fact it in a way it just leads to more problems mm -hmm. which is a really interesting it's kind of a it's a very um complex form of storytelling for like a book that was ostensibly you know maybe marketed towards a younger audience Right. You know, especially back in that day, you might have expected it to just be like, you know, even you think of like the Harry Potter books, it's like, OK, Harry, Harry accomplishes his mission and then it's over. Right. Mm -hmm. But here you have like where you'd think would be the natural ending of the story. Right. The ending of Smile. And it, and it actually you expected it to be the dwarves and Bilbo who killed the dragon, but mm -hmm. it's not them. Right. Yeah. It's this other unknown character. Right. But but then there's a whole five or six chapters left in the book now. Mm -hmm. Right. For mm -hmm. more stuff to happen. Well, it's like what happens in Lord of the Rings, too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the destruction of the ring is not the end of that story. Yeah, the scouring of the Shire. And in that case, it's much more of like a... Extended epilogue. Yeah, extended epilogue. Yeah. Um, but there is, but there are other events in the Lord of the Rings, which, um, you know, I mean, there, there's just so many major events in Lord of the Rings, so it's hard to, you know... But, but, but in that case, you do know that, like, you do, ex like, the destruction of the ring, like, you know that's the end, like... That's yeah, the end of that's it, it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's what you're aiming for the whole time. And it is Frodo who you expect to be the one to destroy the ring, who ultimately, maybe not entirely in the way that you expect it to happen, right. but um, but he nevertheless is responsible for the destruction of the ring, ultimately. Ultimately, right? yes. Yeah. Um, but here now, yeah, with, with Smaug being defeated and it not being the end of the book, it really does kind of beg the question, well, hmm. What what is the point? Right? Yeah, how is how is this gonna get wrapped up? Right. Yeah. There. Well, there's a lot more to there's go. There's a lot more, and I really I really like that. Um, you know, I I like that Bard, a man, is the one to defeat the dragon here. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Even though you're expecting Bilbo and and the dwarves, you know, I kind of like that little twist. Yeah. That, you know, it, it kind of speaks to the whole you know, virtue of perseverance, mm -hmm. right? Like this is probably out of all the characters we've met in the Hobbit thus far, a man, a mere human is probably the last person you would expect to be able to defeat this dragon, mm -hmm. right? They don't have any of the special qualities or, you know, gifts that the elves or the dwarves or, you know, like there's nothing mm -hmm. like super duper special that sets them apart. Right. Um, well, but it's yet he's the one that, that conquers. And it and it's all very, you know, in the middle of this fantasy story, right? You have this very kind of realistic outlook on the way things usually ha actually happen. Yeah. Right. Um, I was just thinking about, um, you know, like you you think about historical examples from even recent history. Um, you know, like I don't know, like when it comes to um like the death of uh, Osama bin Laden, right? Mm -hmm. um, even like, okay, it's like, okay, yeah, he's dead, right? You know, he, he he's paid for what he did, right, for his crimes. And, um, uh, but t even still, there's like, it's not like that's the end of, of terrorism and of the problems that cause right. terrorism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's still so much that has to be done. There's, there's, people have to learn how to work together and not start more wars. Right. Like, and you know, so it's never like, you know, the thing that you actually think is going to complete the mission 
mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, it may complete the mission, but there's still many more problems to deal with. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's just true. I guess it's just truer to reality than yeah, you expect. Yeah, I agree. Right? I totally agree. Um, yeah. So that's it's, uh, good on Tolkien for doing that in this story. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So, yeah. And so the rest of the chapter actually deals with, uh, so what's next? Because, yeah, it's like, great, Smaug's dead, but so's our town pretty much, right? Like Lake Town is pretty much destroyed at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, it's cold. It's the winter. Right. So and it's our and it's in the north. So um, this is a lot of the homes a, have been destroyed. Yeah, and three quarters of the inhabitants of Lake Town have survived. Right. So um, you you've got yeah we're happy that the dragon's dead, but we've got a lot of problems to deal with now. Right. Um, and it says they gathered in mournful crowds upon the western shores, shivering in the cold wind, and their first complaints and anger were against the master who had left the town so soon, while some were still willing to defend it. Hey, can I ask where are they where are they going? I mean, where are they escaping to? The people Just the shores. That, the shores, but is anything there? I mean, it's not like they're going to another town. Well, it's not or, on the water. Well, no, it's cold. not. On, well, that's true, but I mean, it's not like they're being able to to be refugees to another town or city that's nearby. Well, yeah, are but that's they? the problem, right? Like they that that's what they have to figure out. But I mean, the people like the master, right? He left. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm just wondering where he was going. I mean, what's near there where they could actually get what they I, I need? don't know. Like, why did... I mean, he just, he just wants to survive, right? That right. people who leave are just like, I can't survive here, so I'm going to run and try to find just a way to survive. Just try to find a way to survive. Right? The name of the game is survive in that situation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking about it, though. So it's not like you're, you know, it's not like you can, you're fleeing one country for another country. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you're basically fleeing one town for essentially the wilderness. So it's kind of like pick your poison. Well, I'm, right? I, they're not fleeing anymore, right? Like once the dragon's dead, they're not fleeing. They're coming back. They're they're trying to gather together to figure out, okay, what do we do now, right? Yeah. But, you know, in the middle of things, you're, you're not thinking. So they were trying to get off the island. That's they, what they were doing. They were trying to get a lake town so they don't get killed by the dragon. Okay. Right? Like it's like the house is on fire. I don't know where we're going, but we can't stay we here. We can't stay here. Right? Yeah, I guess I was under the impression that they were actually fleeing to another place, and I wasn't sure where they were going. I mean, I don't know specifically. Okay. Um, I think they were all just trying to get away. Just trying to get away. Yeah. Get away as far from the dragon as possible. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so uh, there they are, and they're blaming the master, which is you know the first obvious sign of blame. He was the leader of the town, and, and he runs at trouble, mm-hmm. right? And and they're all like, but this guy, you know, this guy Bard, right? Um, if if he were only alive, then we make him the king. And luckily enough, he is alive, right? So yep. they're all declaring him King Bard, King Bard. Um, and and at this, the master puts on his Machiavellian hat, and he's like, okay, time to maneuver a little bit. Mm-hmm. So he steps in, and he's like, oh yeah, Bard, great job on Bard. You know, like he should go back up to Dale. And restore the town of Dale, since he's that, you know, he's that lord of up there, right? And anybody who wants to go with him is welcome to go with him, right? Um, and and then he's like, but really, why are you blaming me, right? I'm not the one who caused this problem, right? Right? Who really caused the problem? And it's like, well, it's the dwarves, right? The dwarves, they went and they went and they woke up the dragon, and now our town is destroyed. So they've got all that treasure up there. Let's go get the treasure. Right? That's kind of right. the outcome. Yeah. Um uh so, you know, the master is very wise. He knows that Bard is the big hero now, so he tries to kind of grab onto Bard's coattails, right? Yeah. It says as you see, the master had not got his position for nothing. Right. <laughs> very good with words he is. Yeah, he's yeah, you know, he's smart. He's um he knows how to maneuver in mm-hmm. uh in tricky situations and, and he knows how to get out of looking bad, right? Um And good on Bard for like being like, guys, just let's just stop arguing about this. Right. And let's just, you know, go deal with this unguarded treasure. Right. That could very well solve our problems. He, the master says, Who played on our soft hearts and our pleasant fancies? What sort of gold have they sent down the river to reward us? Dragon fire and ruin. From whom should we claim the recompense of our damage and aid for our widows and orphans? Um, so, um, 
uh, yeah, so Bard, um, uh, Bard has this thought that he, they'll go back up uh, into the heart of the mountain um, uh, and and try to gain uh, try to gain the treasure right and and help that to rebuild Dale and help restore the town. Right, while the master scowled at his back. Right, and remained <laughs> sitting on the ground. That's right. Um, yeah. So, um, so you know, but still, even though Bard is going to kind of take this expedition up there, um, you've still got the problem of all these people, women and children, who need somewhere to stay, and and that's at that that's where the um, the elves, the wood elves, kind of come to bring some help. Right. Yeah. So. Some of them come to help uh, get back to uh, to help Bard with recovering the treasure from the mountain, and some come to help rebuild Lake Town, right? So that there's you know that there's shelter, and um, and the Elven King thinks that um, he thinks that Thorin and Co are probably dead, right? Um, so he's like, man, he sh- that Thorin should have just stayed with me, right? He should have just stayed with me, and then he'd be okay. But now here he is, dead. Yeah. Um, and but news of, of Smaug's death spreads uh, spreads pretty quickly. A lot thanks to the birds, apparently. Right. Yes. And, yeah. Again, the mess the the messengers of the air. Right. Even Bjorn um, had heard it. Yeah. In his wooden house. And the goblins were at council in their caves. So the goblins heard it as well. Right. Hmm. Um. Yeah. So. Um. Uh, let's see. I like this little bit about. Um, uh, where is it about Smaug? The like the bones, like the carcass of Smaug lying, like could still be seen. Mm, you know, yeah, that's gross. Um, and even like in inside the lake, right? Like lying on the bed of the lake uh, for a long time. And but even though like he, there were all these jewels and everything attached to it, like nobody ever wanted to yeah. dive down and touch them because they were like kind of believed to be cursed. Yeah, I can't blame them. I yeah. think I'd probably feel the same way. Yeah, I want to ask where. Um, so when I was reading this, I got the impression that the elves were on their way to somewhere else. Were they mm-hmm. heading to the mountain? And then they decided to go help. Um, Cause yeah, here it says, but the King, when he received the prayers of Bard had pity for, he was the Lord of a good and kindly people. So turning his March, which had at first been directed towards the mountain, he hastened now down the river to the long lake. So the, the elves were actually not, initially headed toward lake town hmm. they were headed um, toward the mountain and yeah, i was trying to find that um i would give you my page number but i know you have a different book yeah. it's right before the end it's just a few paragraphs from the end um so it sounds like the elves were headed toward the mountain so were they headed that way because like to help the dwarves so, did they start marching after they heard news of the dragons? No, death? it says they were marching towards the mountain, and um, yeah, they must have started mount- marching toward toward the mountain, toward the lonely mountain, when they heard the news of Smaug's death. Right, right. they were going okay. to get treasure. Right, got it. Got um, it. and then that's some of them, and then some okay. of them turned towards the Long Lake to help. To help. Right? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So that's why they were heading toward the mountain. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, l- I wanted to read this one little thing from the Annotated Hobbit. Okay. Um, there's, there's actually like this whole poem that Tolkien wrote about, about a dragon, um, in here, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll do, you know, some of that on a separate episode. Um, but, uh, in his essay, it says in his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien wrote that as a child, he had desired dragons with a profound desire. Of course, I and my timid body did not wish to have them in the neighborhood intruding into my relatives, my relatively safe world. But the world that contained even the imagination of Fafnir was richer and more beautiful at whatever cost of peril. In an interview for BBC Radio recorded in January 1965, Tolkien added, Dragons always attracted me as a mythological element. They seemed to be able to comprise human malice and bestiality together so extraordinarily well, and also a sort of malicious wisdom and shrewdness. Terrifying creatures. Um, so it's interesting because Tolkien like, kind of loved dragons. Uh, not because he was like, you know, had this weird like obsession with like evil creatures, but like just because he loved the world, the idea of a world with dragons in it. Like mm-hmm. there was this kind of, he just felt like it was a more exciting, fun world. And yeah, he was right. I can't yeah. disagree with that. Although I don't know if you, if you actually had the dragon in your neighborhood, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, about that. that would be a little scary. That would be pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, but he just loved the, like kind of the 
dragon, and I can, t- I think I totally get where he's coming from. Like Smaug, he's not just this. Smaug isn't this, this like, um, big like animalistic lizard, right? right? It's almost like he's like a demon in a lizard's body, in a giant lizard's mm-hmm. body, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, um, he's got he's he's so animalistic, but he's like sh- he's smarter than you are. Yeah, you know, super shrewd, and he clearly has you know a history yeah you know like it's not like he's just this dragon that poof appeared out of nowhere right like he comes from somewhere right and he's yeah there's there's more than meets the eye there totally yeah uh so anyway thought that was a neat note that is a neat note all right um yeah go ahead well i was just gonna say nobody can ever say to tolkien cool story bro needs more dragons yeah that's true because you know because he's like uh my story's got dragons he's like uh yeah it ain't a story if it ain't got a dragon that's right. You know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, time for some haiku. Haiku. There we go. Haiku time. Haiku time. Haiku time. Haiku time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. Boom. Alrighty. Almost like smog f- crashing into the lake. Totally. Yeah. That I know it was, wasn't it? It was totally. Yeah. Boom. I'm sure that's exactly how it sounded. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a dance party it even, broke like, out. echoed like that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Oh, yeah. Rock, paper, scissors time. Rock, paper, scissors. Shoot. shoot. Boom. <sighs> Fudge balls. All right. I'll go first. Okay. A flying flame from the sky, destruction, it seems. And yet, salvation. Oh. It's a very uh, you catastrophic haiku there. Yes. Mm hmm. Well done. Thank you. I like it. All right. Here's mine Bravest of the brave. Bard defeats the dragon. Praise the elves to change course. Nice. Yeah. Right like on. my alliteration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of alliteration. Yeah. Thanks. A lot of alliteration. I like alliteration. Mm-hmm. A lot of alliteration alike. <laughs> I like a lot of alliteration. All right. All right. Um, I am going to read a uh, poem by Joe Towns, our friend from Tasmania. Oh, sweet. Um, you know, he's the one that uh, has started writing poetry after uh, part in, in being, being in part inspired by our exploration of Tolkien's works. And um, so I wanted to read one of his poems and uh, that he sent along. Awesome. So here goes. Make sure I got the right one. Um. Nope. Try again. Here we go. All right. This poem is called Cannot Last. Ground down, poured out, fine powder, blown about. Wilting flowers, thistles bloom, four horsemen tearing through. Stony wall, icy gale, empty heart, silent jail. Lamentation, soul to bear. Mind unmended, sleepless care. Flooding grief, can it be I am loved, you love me? Please forgive me, forget the past. This present me cannot last. Seven devils crouching low, fires burning, darkened stone. Vain to ruin, hopeless fight, tightening noose, loss of sight. Slough of despond, shelob's lair, waiting death, webs of despair. No escape. No relief. Lying serpent beguiles belief. Torn between, I have to choose. One step to fall and all to lose. Please forgive me. Forget the past. This present me cannot last. Waking file, piercing sword. I know that voice amid the horde. Gentle staff, ray of song. Shepherd's rod to him belong. Rattling bones, breath of air. 
standing soldier, shield to bear. Quaking heart, my flesh may fail, but him my cup in this world pale. He found me out, he bought me dear, his treasure now, his kingship here. Please forgive me, forget the past, this present me cannot last. Bearing grit, hidden decay, Christ does sit, enthroned today. And I am told, my ears to hear, that this world's light does not compare. Though I see not beyond the veil, where empty tomb he does not lay. Through blurry eyes I stagger now, I must believe and wait the hour. When painless pearl I hope to be, if I await one day to see. Please forgive me, forget the past, this present me cannot last. Wow. Outstanding, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah, I wanted been meaning to read one of Joe's poems on here, you know, for a little while, and uh, uh, it's very, uh, very moving. He he says a little bit, you know, that it um, it's a poem about grief, depression, and repentance, um, and it was inspired by and alludes to Sam Wise Gamgee and his fight with and defeat of Shelob, among much else. Wow. Um. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Joe. Yeah, that's awesome. And, um, you know, um, uh, just appreciate, uh, you know, appreciate people sharing their creative endeavors oh, with yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. So, Tolkien yeah. is, uh, obviously someone who has inspired me a whole lot creatively. And, um, mm-hmm. I always love hearing how he has inspired others. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Let's, uh, let's hit some correspondence, other correspondence here. Um, our first note this week comes from um oh jennifer on the blog so jennifer has uh has left some comments i I won't read them all um but i'll just kind of summarize so um you know she shared some thoughts on um and she's a little bit more i would say um less pleased with both uh with the 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 films and Mm. um uh, the adapt peter jackson's adaptations of the films and with um uh and with the tolkien uh film itself um, so, you know, Hey, I, we do have this, uh, web. I, I have created a website for the Tolkien road. Um, that's, that's been up there. And so, you know, if you want to, if you're, if you're listening and, um, uh, and you know, you'd like, you know, you're like, well, they recorded this a long time ago. You can go back and continue the con like, you know, have the conversation on a particular episode on that, on the blog. On that blog. So if you want to go back and correspond with, with us, uh, in that way on the blog and, you know, maybe try to start a conversation with others. Uh, that's a good way to do it, but uh, we don't have a whole lot of comments over there right now. But head on over there and start something, right? Yeah. Um, and I encourage you to go over and check out Jennifer's comments on uh, for episodes one fifty nine and one sixty, and uh, you know, offer your own thoughts. Um, you know, respond if you'd like to respond to her uh, criticisms over there. Um, and uh, you know, we're all about having a good conversation about these things. Absolutely. So yeah, that's uh, one of she the offers, reasons we exist. She offers some some good points. So. Cool. Uh, definitely worth you know. Definitely worth checking out if you want to continue the conversation on the films. All right. Um, let's see here. Next up is uh, Teresa, our newest patron, of course. Um, so there's Teresa. Uh, so she sent an amazing note. Yeah. Um, I gotta, I gotta say, Teresa, like I, um, I, <laughs> we saw your pledge come through, and then we got the note, and I immediately forwarded it to Greta, and I was like, look at this awesome note. And, um, you know, every time we get a note like yours, um, and, 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 you know, we don't get them like every day, right. You know, every, you know, it's just, and it's funny because a lot of times it's, it's kind of like this, um, it almost feels like a God wink because, um, you know, maybe it's like things are kind of quiet on the, on the podcast front a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. haven't, haven't heard much correspondence lately or something like that. And all of a sudden you just, we'll just get this really like amazing note from somebody saying like how they love the podcast and, it's meant so much to them in, in a certain way. And, um, and you know, I just remember when we first started this thing, like that was, that was part of why I wanted to do it was mm-hmm. I just wanted to connect with other people yeah. and, yeah. and share the love of Tolkien with other people. And, and that was the biggest goal at the end of the day, you know? Um, and, and maybe just being able to like, kind of you, you know, with Tolkien's work, shine a little light in uh, in the darkness. Right. Um, of the darkness that can sometimes come into our lives. And so, uh, Teresa, your note was a real, like, um, was just a real, like, 
was, was a light like that. You yeah, know? it um, really was. Not not that like things are particularly dark in our lives right now or anything like that, but just but it's so encouraging. But it, it is. It's super encouraging, yeah. you know. Um, and um, yeah, I just as I was reading it, I just was so as I was reading it again yesterday and sending a short note of response to Teresa, which you know I plan on sending you a little bit longer one. Um, I just felt I just felt kind of overwhelmingly grateful you know, mm-hmm. for the opportunity to do this mm-hmm. podcast and, mm-hmm. you know, to connect with people from around the world. Yeah. I know there's people out there like that, that, yeah. you know, appreciate it and I, enjoy I, it so much. I was just thinking to myself, like, you know, first, you know, we, we get this, uh, we get these awesome notes from Joe, um, in, uh, Tasmania mm-hmm. and, and it's like, well, I never thought that we'd have like, you know, listeners or even like no people in Tasmania. And then, um, and then we get one from Sweden. Right, we've had other mm-hmm. Swedish listeners in the past, and and folks who have corresponded with us, um, and you know, would love to hear from from y'all again. Um, but but another another one from Sweden, mm-hmm. right? And he's originally from Italy. He's originally from Italy. Yeah. So, um, it it's just it, it's, it's very cool. It you just kind of have to pinch yourself, you right? Really do. You know, it's like wow, what a what a dream yeah. this all is. I love now in her note, Teresa said she was making a a road trip, um. I think it was somewhere in Sweden. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. And uh, I guess she's driving very slow. She made a point to say she's driving very slow. 15 and there were kilometers n- per hour. So there were no other cars on the road. But So she's taking a video of the scenery. Mm-hmm. And you can hear us in the background talking about the Silmarillion. Yeah. Because she's listening to the podcast as she's driving and making this film. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing. I know. I said <laughs> I said if uh, if you don't... I, I, I sent her a note. In the note I sent her last night, I said... Uh, uh, I would love to see that video. Yeah, if you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's really cool. But very cool. Um, but yeah, Teresa, um, we're so uh, so happy to meet you and to hear from you, and uh, and thank you again so much for being a patron. And um, and we will uh, more more to follow. And uh, and and please do keep in touch as you know you continue on the yeah, road with us. Absolutely. So yeah. All right. Um, uh, next is from John Rice, uh, who is a patron and a uh, correspondent many times uh, over the last few months. And um, he says, uh, sorry for the lack of correspondence lately. Uh, I've been dragging my feet purchasing a copy of The Hobbit to read along with your episodes, and it turns out that I may have purchased one of the first edition copies. That is at least what it says on the front of the book. Uh, I'm hoping this means that my chapter of Riddles in the Dark will be the first edition version and therefore different than yours. I will make note to write in after I listen to your episode if they are in fact different. Um, and then he, and then he shares that that's interesting in and of itself that you, you might've found a first edition uh, copy of the book. So yeah, we're looking forward to hearing more about that, but he shares this interesting note. Apparently he is a, uh, he works at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, uh, as an ornithologist. So oh, that's birds. Yeah. He says, he says a bird nerd. That's right? awesome. That's <laughs> um, awesome. And, uh, and he, you know, he says, but I'm, of course, interested in far more than just birds, like reptiles and amphibians. He says, a good friend and co-worker of mine who works in the section of herpetology, which is reptiles and amphibians, sent me a photo of a heavily armored lizard one day with the caption Smaug, more like Smug. I asked her where she got the name Smaug, and she said that is the lizard's uh, genus. Oh, right? no way. And so, excitedly, I checked the web and found an entire genus with eight species of lizards named after Tolkien's dragon from The Hobbit. And get this, the genus is from Southern Africa. As you know, Tolkien is from South Africa. How rad is that? Oh, my gosh. So, uh, he Whoa. sent a link to the, the genus of this type of lizard. Um, and so, the genus was named after right. Tolkien's character. Right. Not the other way around. Right. Wow. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? That um, is really and cool. So I'm looking at the Wikipedia article on this on this genus Smaug, right? And uh, it says it was named after for the character Smaug in J.R.R. Tolkien's oh The Hobbit. Oh my gosh! Wow. Um, and it says according to Tolkien, the name is derived from the old German verb smugen to squeeze through a hole. Like the type, like the type species, Smaug lived underground and was heavily armored. Uh, apparent, appropriately, Tolkien was born in the Free State Province, South Africa, the core area of distribution of the type species. The name is masculine. Huh. Um, well, yeah. How about that? So that's really, really th- cool. that is really interesting. Um, I, and there's eight. Yeah, there's eight different species. And there's I'm look, looking at one on here, the head of it, and it looks kind of like like a, a little miniature smile. It kind of does. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. With like all those pricklies and yeah, it's got it. It, it looks like it's ready for scales. battle. It totally does. <laughs> yeah, it looks armored for yes. sure. 
Definitely. It looks like it looks like a. Uh, I'm glad it's not a larger because it looks like it would just eat you. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, or breathe fire on and you. And you wouldn't and, even or, see and it coming. You. Right. You would just poof, be gone. Right. Yeah. Um. So awesome to hear from you. Uh, hear yeah, from you, John. that is so cool. Um, Thanks and, for sharing. And, and please do continue to keep in touch. And, um, and and by the way, his note about the South African thing reminded me that one other interesting fact about Teresa, our friend, our new friend Teresa, is um, oh her birthday. Her birthday. She was born on let me pull it January third, January third, nineteen ninety two, which is exactly one hundred years after. J.R.R. Tolkien. No way. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That's yeah. awesome sauce. Wouldn't that be so cool to have yeah. that to have that birthday, right? That is very cool. Uh, she says to me that's destiny, and uh, I would agree. Can't 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 disagree with you that. You're destined no. to be a Tolkien yeah, fan. Cannot argue. Yes. I think I think she's right on. All right. Let's see. Um, next note is from Bethany Engler, um, another person who has corresponded many times with us and a patron, um, and she shares a, a lot of thoughts about the about the movies, um, and uh, and she says, having just watched The uh, Desolation of Smogging recently, I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion, had a few thoughts to share as well. Some mentioned the scene uh, where Bilbo kills some sort of strange creature in Mirkwood in order to get the ring back. I've always found this scene rather puzzling and intriguing and was happy to hear some other thoughts on it. Um, and and so she kind of, you know, she, she has some thoughts she shares about the, the nature of the ring and that kind of thing. And then she jumps down a little bit more and she says, as a side note, I did a little research on what the strange creature in Mirkwood might be. And some say it is a small crustacean or a baby spider, and some say it's a Mirkwood centipede. I'm not really sure, but the movie does seem to portray it it as an innocent creature, and you are made to feel a little sorry for it after Bilbo cuts it to pieces. It is a very interesting point in Bilbo's character development, too, as it makes a good setup for how the ring would continue to gain control over him. It opens up a lot of good discussion points, and I hope to hear if you have any more thoughts on it as well. It makes me kind of think it'd be fun, maybe eventually, to go back and watch all the movies with the. Um, have you ever watched a movie with like the com- the commentary on? Uh huh. So I think, didn't we do that once with one of the Lord of the Rings movies, or maybe it was? I've done it a couple of times, but I, feel I don't like think I've done I've ever it at done least it. once. Okay, not maybe, with Tolkien movie though. I don't think so, but but it can be fun um to just go back and like and so maybe it'd be fun to like do it like one hour at a time or something like that mm. and like talk about the the different because a lot yeah. of times they reveal a lot of really interesting things about the that's making of the films and why yeah, they made certain true. decisions and yeah and that sort of thing so hmm. yeah definitely might be something to think about to do. doing yeah um you know we got to kind of start thinking about the future because uh, we only have a few chapters left in the hobbit so you know, what are we going to hmm. do next right? oh well you know the world of Tolkien Tolkien is vast yeah i'm kind of leaning towards um doing uh humphrey carpenter's biography i think it'd be really interesting to read oh and read and discuss the biography of tolkien one chapter at a time. i need to read more nonfiction, so i would enjoy that yeah 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 it's it, i think it'd be very illuminating like to understand more of his life i think that'd be yeah. really cool yeah it's yeah. good i've read it before and there's other really good biographies of of tolkien uh, but it's the it's kind of the official one so, Has it been endorsed by the Tolkien estate? I think it was commissioned by them, but we'll we, we have to oh, talk okay. about that when we go back and okay, and uh, when we do it eventually well, talk about it. That's exciting to think about. Um, so um, anyway, Bethany, thank you for yeah. sharing all of your thoughts on on that, and um, and yeah, continue to keep in touch. Great, always great to hear from you. Uh, let's see, and then we heard from David Bigwood, of course, uh, one of the, you know, I I, I kind of think the mighty David Bigwood because he's he's just one of these kings of Tolkien knowledge in my mind. He right? keeps us humble. <laughs> um, I'm always kind of like, whenever I'm not sure about something, I'm like, I think about David listening. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, oh man, what, what's David? Oh. Gonna, I just butchered that. What's David going to think, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> He's our standard. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he actually, he writes in and he says, I'll have to disagree with you about the chapter not at home being dull. Uh, and I'm not surprised that David no. would disagree with that. Yeah. Um, while it lacks action, it does have suspense. The dragon could pop up or return at any moment. True. Bilbo is always there to remind us and the dwarves of that. There's also the terror of total darkness. Between the dragon and the dark, there's plenty to keep me reading. Mm, yeah, good perspective. That is and, the good point. And for I sure. think I think sometimes it's when you've already read it many times and you know that the dragon isn't coming back, it can be yeah. um, yes. <laughs> like you you yeah. remember what it may have been like to read it the first you, you lose track of what it may have been like to read it the right. first time. But you know he's not gonna come back. So right. yeah. But that is that is a very good, very good point. Yeah, uh, he also recommends a brief history of the Hobbit by John D. Ratliff. Um, it, uh, he was the archivist of the manuscripts of the Hobbit. He says he gives the earlier and later manuscript versions of the text. 
He says it's fascinating. It includes the three chapters of Tolkien's retelling in a high style done in 1960. It lacks the charm of the book we have. Uh, he also has a long, uh, yeah, so it includes those three chapters. You know, I actually do have that on, um, uh, what, what is it? I have the, um, uh, I have it on, on my Kindle, right? So wait, there's another an version e of The Hobbit that has three extra chapters? So that's where this whole thing about it came from, right? The the other, like Tolkien did begin the process of rewriting, of rewriting The it. Hobbit and more of the style of The Lord of the Rings. And he got only got through the first three We chapters. definitely need to do that, like go back and read those when okay. uh, when we're done with The Hobbit itself okay. and, and talk about those chapters. So it's the first three chapters of yeah. The Hobbit rewritten. Yeah. I see. And, um, and you know, David, as David says, um, it lacks the charm of the book we he have. He calls it high style. Yes. So more in the style of Lord of the Rings. Right, okay. yeah. Um, he says he also has a long discussion of the Arkenstone and the Silmarils. He concludes oh. that they were the same, sort of. Tolkien was borrowing from all his earlier work, but still saw the Silmar the Hobbit as separate from work from the legends, which is kind of, I think, what we were yeah, we were speculating, talking, yeah. how yeah. we were speculating about it last week. As the book was revised, it moved steadily into mythology uh, had me convinced the book is only about ten dollars in paper and only two dollars in the Kindle. And I, yeah, I do have it on the Kindle, but I I want to go get it, um, uh, the paperback version, so we can uh, read it later. So, uh, anyway, great hearing from you, David. Yeah, always uh, always great to hear from you, and thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for writing in. Thank you. Let's see here, and then uh, new new um, review. Just wanted to share awesome stuff people said about us on mm. iTunes, and uh, this is from. It says a great podcast and Tolkien Fest. It says, very clear how passionate John and Greta are about all things related to Tolkien. Always interesting and honest. Occasional rabbit trails that add that add to keep the show entertaining. Highly recommended for anyone with an interest in the world of Middle Earth. Yay. So Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for your very kind comment. Absolutely. All right. Um, Phew. Yeah. Lots of good stuff. Yeah. That yeah, covered every... Yeah, I got them all. You did. All right. Um, so yeah, don't forget to leave us a review that five star rate us five stars on, uh, whatever you use the top rating on wh whatever app you use. If it's iTunes, five stars, uh, and then, you know, what, it, whatever your app is of choice, uh, same deal, best rating if highest, you can. Highest, highest possible. Um, Please. and, uh, yeah, feel free to say some nice words about us too. Yeah. And, and always feel free to reach out and, uh, let us know how you're doing and mm -hmm. who you are and. Uh, about your journey through Tolkien's world. John so. is very good about responding to all of those emails. I try to. I try to be. I don't. I don't always get around to it immediately, but um, eventually he will. Yeah, he's much better at it than I was. I'll just <laughs> tell you that much. All right, um, you were pretty good at it. Huh. Depended on the day, but thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks again to our patrons. You all rock. Uh, we got Al Taylor, Andrew Herbert, Andrew Thomas, Asia Veneer. Um, Bethany Engler, Brendan Corkery, Brian Orr, Cat Lane, Chris Loftus, Chuck Farnung, Daniel Delaney, David Bigwood, David Dickinson, Emilio Perea, Eric Bissett, Hunter Johns, Ish of the Hammer, James Applegate, James Lindbergh, Joe Towns, John Rice, Josh Sosa, Lawrence McGowan, Margaret Lyon, Matt Scarrance, Robert Franks, Sarah Murphy, Shannon Stockbridge, Teresa Colangelo, Travis Lawheed, Ty Miller, Dr. William Hutton, and Zeke Farmer. You all rock. Absolutely. You all rock steady. Death rock. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I think that's a wrap. Is that a wrap? I think so. I would have to agree. It's the wrap. Okay. Well. Yeah. That kind of wrap. Wrap. Oh, and yeah. the other kind that of wrap, too. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk yes, to you next thank time. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye, y'all.